come and chat. Um, it, it feels it does feel a bit weird coming to the fisheries uh, uh, folks and chatting about whales, but I have been devoting quite a fair amount of time to to blue whales in the last few years. Um, and and just to give you a little information about this particular video here, um, this shows a blue whale, actually a pygmy blue whale, a small version subspecies blue whale, engulfing a small uh, a swarm of krill. And what you may not know is that blue whales can engulf so much water in one lunge that they could fit an entire adult humpback whale in their mouth, which is itself lunge feeding. Okay. Uh, but don't worry, they couldn't swallow it because the throat of a blue whale is so narrow that they choke on a loaf of bread. Okay, so there's your blue whale fact for today. Um, so why am I doing this? I'm, I'm on sabbatical. I'm writing a book on blue whales. I've done so much work on blue whales that I decided it was time to try and put everything down on paper that I've known. And this involves just a tremendous amount of reading and a tremendous amount of thinking. And, and some of what has occurred to me in this period of my sabbatical is that as faculty, we rarely spend enough time thinking and reading. Uh, and we spend a lot of time doing things like administration or teaching or mentoring. Um, and as a result, um, it's, it's kind of hard to get into the space where you are just thinking about new theories. Um, so as a result, much of what I'm going to talk about here is unpublished. It's being worked on either by myself or my students, or uh, in some cases, large or small groups of collaborators. Um, so please respect that. Don't go steal my work or anything like that. Um, but I have uncovered so many cool mysteries about blue whales, some of which I have hypotheses for and some of which I don't. And I'd like to share just a few of those with you today. So that's that's my my spiel. So the first mystery is, why are blue whales found in some places and not in others? A very simple question at the basic heart of ecology. Why do some species occur in some areas and not in others? And if you go look on Wikipedia or you look up the IUCN red list, you see this kind of map that says, hey, blue whales are found basically wherever there is ocean water, with a very, very few exceptions, like not in, that, not in the Mediterranean, not in the in the in the Arctic, um, not in Hudson Bay, so a few major inland seas, but pretty much everywhere else. But this map is completely misleading. There are vast areas of the oceans where blue whales are never encountered, and other areas where they occur in very high, I should say relatively high densities, because because nowhere in the world are blue whales really in the same kind of high densities as some of the other species of whales, not anymore. So here's a map showing where um, catches of blue whales took place. And um, all the blue circles here, and bigger circles are more catches, smaller circles are fewer catches, show where blue whales are caught. And what immediately you see is the Antarctic was the core place where blue whales were found before whaling. That band of blue surrounding the Antarctic is a dense, collection of catches caught by modern whaling. Something like 90% of all blue whales were caught in that dense band of Antarctic catches. And everywhere else you can see that blue whales are caught usually kind of close to land um, with a bit more caught in the middle of the Indian Ocean. But there are also some places where there are no blue whales. And I say the I say this not just from catches, but also from sightings and strandings and acoustics and, and all the other things we have for figuring out where blue whales occur. Um, so all these red X's here are regions where there are no blue whales, past or present. And you'll immediately see that they're not occurring in places that are relatively shallow. So all these areas are continental shelves. They're not the slopes, they're not the abyssal depths. Um, they're also all enclosed by archipelagos or small islands or something like that. So all of these places like uh, Hudson Bay, uh, the Bering Sea, Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, the Coral Sea, the South China Sea, Sea of Akats, all of those are 
enclosed areas where blue whales could go into, but they just don't really seem to go into. Um, so that's our first clue. They tend to be absent from continental shelf areas that are enclosed by archipelagos. And, and it will become clear later in the talk why that is so. But for the moment, just keep that thought in mind. Why do they avoid those areas? Now, blue whales are not a monolithic single species that occurs everywhere. There are designated subspecies. Um, everybody agrees that Antarctic blue whales are one of those and that pygmy blue whales are another. Um, Northern blue whales, well, they could be two separate groups, maybe in the, in the Pacific and the Atlantic. Chilean blue whales are certainly separate from all the others, um, but haven't been designated as a subspecies. But this is my personal way of thinking about the four major groupings of, of blue whales into what I would like to see as subspecies. And you might ask, well, what is the difference between something like a pygmy blue whale and an Antarctic blue whale? And the answer is size and body shape. Um, so, so here is kind of a slightly complicated figure. It shows blue whale catches in little length histograms in bins of 10 degree longitude and one degree latitude in an area where Antarctic blue whales and pygmy blue whales have their kind of division. And what I've done in the histograms is I've colored in red all of the whales that are bigger than the biggest known pygmy blue whale, which only grow to 80 feet or so. So um, Antarctic blue whales though, only really become sexually mature at just under 80 feet. And I use feet because almost all the whaling catches were recorded in feet. And so what you see is this very clear division. All the histograms filled with red are down in the south, mostly south of about 54 south. And all of the histograms that are purely gray, which are smaller than 80 feet, are north of about 50, 51 south. And that's the exact division between these two subspecies in the Southern Indian Ocean. And hold this in mind because later in the talk, I'm gonna explain why this division is there and why the two subspecies don't mingle more than, 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 you, than, than you see in these, in these catch data. Okay, so very clear spatial separation. Now, not only are there subspecies, but we can further divide blue whales into separate populations, each of which is ge somewhat geographically separate. There is a bit of overlap. And we do this using blue whale song. Blue whale song is something that is only sung by males, we think. It's highly repetitive. They can keep on singing the same thing over and over and over again for hours. So male only repeating the same thing over and over again. Um, a bit like mansplaining. They're highly repetitive. They're extremely deep frequencies. So these frequencies go down to perhaps 10 or 15 Hertz in almost all the populations. And at most goes up to about 100 or 105 Hertz. Very, very deep. If I was to try and play them at regular speed, you would need a really good speakers to hear the vibrations that they would cause. And you probably couldn't hear them on your laptop. Um, and yet these songs are conserved certainly over decades, recognizably heard over decades. Yet in every one of these populations, they're mysteriously declining in frequency everywhere. They're getting deeper as if they were simultaneously all going through puberty at the same time and their voice is breaking. Every one of them is just going down a little bit every single year. And if I had a good explanation for that, I'd have it in the talk, but I don't. So I'm just going to leave that nugget for you um, as an unexplained mystery of blue whales and move on. But what we can do and is really important is we can use these songs to further separate our blue whales into individual populations. So in this plot, um, each of these three or four or five letter acronyms represents one population. So for example, the NEPO is the Northeast Pacific Ocean population that occurs off Mexico, California, and even goes up through um, off Vancouver Island and the Gulf of Alaska. Um, 
Similarly, the SWIO population in the Southern Indian Ocean is, is off south of Madagascar on the western and southern side of the Indian Ocean. So there are about 11 populations. They're not perfectly divided by song. For example, there are two songs in, in Chile, or, or sorry, the Southeast Pacific. And there's only one song in the North, um, in the North Atlantic, but we consider there to be two populations there. Um, okay, so we have blue whales divided by subspecies, divided by populations. Um, what determines where they are and why they're there? Um, and so I'm gonna ask a, <clears throat> a question. Everyone knows this joke probably. What does an 800 pound gorilla eat? And the answer is anything it wants. All right, so, so then by analogy, what does a 150 ton blue whale eat? And the answer is not anything at once. The answer is only krill, but, but not all krill, just nicely aggregated krill of the correct species at the right place at a comfortable depth. Okay, so blue whales, blue whales are very picky eaters. Uh, they only eat krill, and for those that, are, that know blue whales, there are a couple of exceptions to that, but I'm going to ignore that for the moment. But all other baleen whales eat a pretty broad variety of prey. If there are lots of krill, they'll eat krill. If there are sardines, they'll go after sardines. If they're herring, they'll go after herring. Maybe some of them specialize in copepods or squid or whatever, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they'll feed a much broader variety of prey than blue whales will. Um, out of the 86 known krill species, which occur in vastly different places, each species has its own distribution range. Some are open ocean, some are near shore, some are over the, the slopes. Only a very small handful are ever targeted by blue whales as their primary prey. Um, and each blue whale population that I just showed you specializes on feeding on only at most three species of krill. Okay, so here I've given you three of the species on the right um, uh, that I'll, I'll explain a little bit further where they occur in, in a moment. But the key is this, each blue whale population is found only where those krill species that it specializes on are found. And this seems kind of super obvious, and yet what I see over and over again, and I've, I've collated something like 50 papers trying to predict where blue whale habitat is, and I guarantee you that zero of them have correlated blue whale distribution with krill distribution, because we have really good data on sea surface temperature, salinity, on chlorophyll, on all kinds of oceanographic things that you can get from space. We don't have such great krill distribution maps that you could use to do real time or dynamic maps of where blue whales might be. So <clears throat> when I came across the series of krill maps and it showed me these kind of patterns, I, I just blew, it blew my mind. So, so look at this. Where do Northeast and Northwest Pacific blue whales occur? Okay, so top left, um, can you see my, my uh, pointer? Top left here is a map of historical catches. The blue stars are where we know there are high densities of blue whales off the coast of California and off the Gulf of California. They're also down by the Costa Rica dome. They don't occur in the Bering Sea. They don't occur in the Sea of Akats. They don't occur in the, in the Japan Sea, all right? These ones specialize mostly on Euphorsia pacifica. Okay, all right, so bottom left is where fin whales, say whales, and Mickey whales occur. And you can see they do occur in these inland uh, regions that, have, that are enclosed by archipelagos. But now look at the distribution of Euphorsia pacifica. They don't occur in these inland seas that are enclosed by archipelagos. They don't occur in the Bering Sea. They occur in areas that almost perfectly mimic where blue whales were caught or are seen now in large-scale surveys. Um, and, these, and these catches plotted top left 
don't include all of the areas that blue whales really did occur because they're over a much wider range than their catches. Now, these blue whales also feed on two other species. Here's the distribution range for Thysanovessa spinifera. And again, big concentration of California, where we see a lot of blue whales in summer, one of the big uh, places people did research on. A lot of them up in the Gulf of Alaska. And they also feed on Nyctophanes simplex, but they only feed on Nyctophanes simplex in the Gulf of California. So only in this little area over here do they specialize on Nyctophanes simplex, and that's in, in winter. Now, the correspondence for this particular pair of populations is quite remarkable. But now let's go and look at some of the other blue whale populations. I'm not going to go through them all, don't worry. Northeast and Northwest Atlantic blue whales. We know they are not found in Hudson Bay. They're not found in the Mediterranean. They're not found in the Gulf of Mexico. They're not found in the Caribbean Sea. And Oddly enough, they're not found in the Arctic, except for this area around Svalbard, Iceland, and north of Norway, um, which is kind of mysterious. But now when you look at the species that they specialize on, which is largely Meganectophanes norvegica and Thysanoessa enormis, you see that their distribution where they occur is, again, perfectly mapped out by the distribution of these two species of krill. They do feed a little bit on Thysnesa rashii in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, um, but, but not much elsewhere. Okay, let's look at my favorite. And remember I said that there was this big division between Antarctic blue whales and pygmy blue whales. Um, and you can see in the bottom left panel, you can see this line dividing them. Well, Antarctic blue whales specialize mostly on Euphorsia superba. That's 95% of what they eat is, is that. And if you look at the map of where that krill species occurs, it's all south of one of these convergence zones um, down here, close to the Antarctic Peninsula, and not further away. But pygmy blue whales, at least the ones in the Madagascar population, feed almost entirely on Euphorsia valentini, a totally different species of krill. And when you look at the distribution of superba versus valentini, the pink ones on the left and the green ones on the right, and I apologize for those who are colorblind, you see there is no overlap between those two krill species. And the division between those krill species is exactly the division between Antarctic and pygmy blue whales. These two subspecies, these two populations, specialize on one crawl species or the other, but not both. Okay. And one last thing, and my favorite discovery about Antarctic blue whales, is they also feed on Euphorsia crystallorophius. This is the ice crawl. It occurs only super close to the Antarctic continent. Usually it's, it's inaccessible. Usually it's in polynias that are close to the continent openings where the ice opens up and there's, there's a gap and the whales can't easily get in there but they can get into the Ross Sea so the circle here and all the in, in all the maps is the Ross Sea and what you find in the Ross Sea is plenty of blue whales plenty of minke whales and no humpback whales at all and humpback whales all around the continent are found close to the ice edge in all the same places as Antarctic blue whales and the same places as, as Antarctic minke whales. And, and lest you think this is just one survey, this survey is one that is, is near and dear to my heart. It's the IWC's, IDCR, and SOA surveys where I, I started on all my blue whale work and I got estimates for abundance for, for a bunch of different species. Um, you also see it in other surveys in the area. Um, so here is the, the JARPA set of surveys. And again, wherever you see the Ross Sea, you see no humpback whales. They're absent there. They clearly, for whatever reason, they do not like eating Euphorsia crystallorophius, but they're perfectly happy to feast on Euphorsia superba. Okay, so 
Why are blue whales found in some places and not others? Food. Okay, blue whales are picky, and each population has the same distribution as the krill species that they eat, and that's true both in summer and in winter. Um, and part of the work I'm doing on my book is trying to collate all the information about what they feed together and ask deeper questions. Um, and, and this is, is, is a, a PhD chapter of one of my students, Christina Randrup, um, that she's working on on this particular project, which I think is absolutely fascinating. So let's move on to another mystery. Where do they go in winter? Where are the winter breeding and calving grounds of blue whales? And for those of you that have stacked satellite transmitters on blue whales, some of the populations we do know the answer to and some of them we don't. Antarctic blue whales is still quite a mystery. So the classic baleen whale migration hypothesis, and, and this, this plot comes from a paper entitled Distribution of Southern Blue and Fin Whales, where the author, uh, Macintosh, really was the expert on blue whales, had, had written the seminal monograph in 1929 with uh, Wheeler, that everybody still refers to. And he was asked to summarize, where do they where do they go? Where did they migrate to? And he basically said, well, all the other baleen whales do this migration thing where they feed near the poles in, in summer, and then they go somewhere else to breeding grounds, distinct breeding grounds in winter. Unfortunately, we haven't found those grounds for blue whales and fin whales yet. But by analogy with humpback whales, they must be somewhere and they must be aggregate somewhere to breed and to carve. Um, so let's go to humpback whales and say, what do we know about humpback whales? And this is, for those that work on humpback whales, probably a little bit of a caricature, but the idea holds. They feed in the summer on, um, in, in summer feeding grounds at high latitudes. And in the winter, they go to low latitudes temperate or even tropical grounds to, to breed and, and carve, okay? So let's just zoom in a little bit on one of these areas um, in the square over here in Western Australia. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a story. There was, there was a whaling expedition called the Ulysses. There's an absolutely fascinating book on this that's available by, by Walsh. It's an online, online book that you can, you can download that talks about a single modern whaling expedition called the Ulysses that was US owned and US flagged. So American whaling vessel, and a fleet actually, because it's a, it's a processing vessel plus a bunch of catcher boats. And they spent their winter in Shark Bay in Western Australia, this relatively defined bay off Western Australia. And in those three months, they caught and processed more than 2,000 humpback whales in that one bay. And not a single one that was examined had any food in their stomachs. Okay. So humpbacks follow this paradigm. They feed in summer. And in winter, they migrate. They find a nice sheltered, cozy bay to hang out in, calm, shallow coastal region. When they get there, then they give birth, they form these large aggregations, they carve, they mate, and they fast. They don't do anything else. They just sort of hang around in this bay and you know, just be good parents, I guess, all right? Blue whales don't do any of these things because, and this is a central thesis of the second half of my talk, because of fear. Right. What are they afraid of? What are blue whales so afraid of? Well, I'm going to talk about two papers that are, in my mind, two of the seminal papers on baleen whales. The first one is this one is called Why Do Baleen Whales Migrate? I mean, it seems like why why not just stay in the Antarctic and there's food there? Why move and go to temperate or even tropical regions? And there, there are lots of explanations, thermoregulation, that doesn't work. Calm water, but there are calm waters in polar, polar seas. Tradition, well, that assumes there's no pressure 
for millions of years from evolution. Resource tracking, maybe, but then why do humpbacks go in fast in winter? And their favorite explanation was killer whale predation. That killer whales are more abundant at high latitudes where seals are super common, and they're much less abundant at lower latitudes. And baleen whales migrate simply to reduce the predation risk from killer whales on their calves. And this was absolutely provoked a lot of discussion. I would say one of the, the chief antagonists was Phil Clapham, who said, this just doesn't make sense. We never see killer whale predation. But uh, in 2017, 16 years later, he wrote a paper saying, basically, I was wrong. He says, look, we, we as scientists need to admit when we're wrong. I have since changed my mind and we need to be the, the we, to, to advance the science that we work on. We need to make sure that when we change our minds, we tell people. And so he wrote a paper explaining that. OK, so why do they migrate? Well, maybe it's killer whale predation. And this gets me on to the second one of my absolute favorite papers, which is this one called Fight or Flight Anti-Predator Strategies of Baleen Whales by Ford and Reeves. And they said, you know, it's really interesting when you look across baleen whale species, and, and this is a phylogeny, a, a genetic phylogeny of baleen whales based on whole genome sequencing, uh, which is fascinating in itself, but I'm just going to merely point out that species are in two groups. They're either flight species. When they encounter killer whales, they swim away as fast as they can. And that's the blue whales, say whales, minke whales and fin whales. And there are fight species that when they encounter killer whales, they stand and fight and they, they thrash around with their flippers and their flukes um, and they're slow and maneuverable and they, they don't swim away, swim away. And what you see from the phylogeny is that this is not simply a genetic two clades of genetically different whales that humpback whales are closely related to minke and fin whales, whereas the, and, but are, are fight species um, and all the others are flight species in that group. So it's not a simple genetic relationship. Uh, and anybody that wants to ask me about that mess in the middle of that tree, I'm happy to, to uh, talk about that at another time, but that's not central to this, to this story. Why do we care that these are two groups, that they're flight species and fight species? Well, first of all, the American sailboat whalers and the British and other countries that went and caught Moby Dicks of their day, they only targeted the fight species. Okay, this is just a fabulous paper by Smith et al. in 2012, showing how these whalers went all around the world. Every place where there is a, a, a light blue shading is somewhere that they were searching for, for whales to catch. The red is where they caught right whales, and the green is where they caught humpbacks, and the light pink is where they caught gray whales, bowheads up in the Arctic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They caught only the fight species because they were slow swimming. They aggregated. They didn't flee when they encountered danger, and they floated when they died. All right? They couldn't target... Uh, uh, they could not target fin whales, blue whales, say whales, because they sank, they were too big, they were too strong, and they swam away as soon as they encountered danger and they just couldn't uh, uh, latch onto them. It was only with modern whaling, which mainly targeted the remaining species, the flight species, that this was possible. So modern whaling, fast boats, explosive harpoons, steam powered boats, air pumps to keep the carcasses afloat, um, and, and started in the 1870s and spread and really exploded when it hit the Antarctic with the advent of pelagic whaling, which was enabled them to free themselves from um, land stations and go and whale wherever they wanted to. World War II, whaling stopped. But after that, it resumed. And in the late 50s, the Soviet Union abandoned all spatial regulations and started catching whales throughout the Pacific Atlantic and Indian Oceans. After the moratorium in the 80s, whaling died way down, um, and there are just a few countries practicing it today. So 
the thesis of Ford and Reeves was that fight species, they carve in shallow coastal waters or lagoons. They're easy to defend. They have coastal migratory corridors. They often have hardened patches of, patches of skin or barnacle encrustations. And they reduce killer whale predation by increasing the risk of injury and by increasing the handling time needed to try and target a, a calf. The flight species on the other hand are found in open water. They don't want to be confined. Remember those, those, those shallow seas surrounded by islands, archipelagos that blue whales stay out of. They have smooth streamlined bodies and skin for high speed sustained swimming. And they reduce predation by requiring high speed prolonged chases. They're the fastest swimmers amongst all of the whale species. So this was the Ford and Reeves um, hypothesis, I should say theory. Um, as I've been reading, I've realized that much more than just those aspects are controlled by fight versus flight. Um, so some of the deeper implications of how these two groups of whales differ are when they migrate, the fight species want to be along narrow highways in a confined time period close to shore. The flight species want to be as widely dispersed as possible and with highly variable timing across individuals and years. You don't want to be in a predictable place where killer whales could find you. The winter aggregations, well, the fight species want to be in dense carving places so you can engage in group defense. And there've been some recent interesting papers on humpbacks coming to the aid of other species being attacked by killer whales. If you're a flight species, you want to disperse and give birth as widely as possible to avoid attracting killer whales. You don't want to be in an aggregation because if you're in an aggregation, the killer whales might eventually figure out where you go in winter. If you're a fight species, you want to make sure you reach your aggregation in your winter area before you give birth. But if you're a flight species, you really want to give birth as soon as you leave the feeding grounds and you're in open water and you're far away from any aggregations. Okay, so well, let's look at this last little bit, the timing of carving being several months earlier in, in my hypothesis than for fight species. So for blue whales, we have data on how big the fetuses are in the whaling data. And you can see over time they're growing. So in the bottom left here, these are fetuses in pregnant blue whales that were all recorded, showing how their growth goes up. And in the top part of this above the horizontal line is all of the young calves that were caught that were shorter than the length at weaning. In the 1930s, it became illegal to catch um, uh, uh, blue whales under 70 feet, which is well above this weaning length. And so the data is largely confined to the 1920s. And what you can see is this nice division and smooth line going through these data points showing that carving must peak in about early May for Antarctic blue whales. So the, the analogy would be um, in the Northern hemisphere, six months later would be early November. Um, and the range is from March to early July. Um, and there, there's a, a, a neat effort by uh, uh, Ashley Rendon and Zoe Rand, um, undergraduate and a graduate in my lab, to update this plot and try and get better estimates of this range of, of carving timing for Antarctic blue whales. What else are some deeper implications of fight versus flight beyond what Ford and Reeves had? Well, where do they mate if you're a flight species in the winter aggregations? If you're a flight species, you want to disperse as widely as possible. What about feeding in winter? Well, guess what? If you're all aggregated in a coastal spot and you're a flight species, there's no food there. So those humpbacks in Shark Bay, well, there's no food in Shark Bay. It's a perfect place for carving and protecting your calf. It's a terrible place for feeding. But if you're a flight species, you can go and head out and find supplemental feeding wherever you want to in winter. You don't have to fast all the way through winter. And so I, I just love this quote in Lord of the Rings about hobbits. It says, and laugh they did and eat 
and drink often and heartily, being fond of simple jests at all times and of six meals a day when they could get them. And so my thesis is that blue whales are hobbits, not humpbacks. That if they find food, they will eat it, um, whether it's summer or winter. And there's now plenty of evidence. And this is not a controversial thing that blue whales feed in winter now. Plenty of evidence of blue whale feeding in the Costa Rica Dome, the Gulf of California, in the Azores, Mauritania. They're present year-round in Sri Lanka. They feed there in winter. They're present year-round in New Zealand. They feed there all year. They're feeding in winter months in, in the Timur Trough. Um, and I'm sure that there are many, many other places that I haven't um, delved into deeply just for this talk to figure out all the other winter places that they feed. Um, what are some other implications of fight versus flight? Well, what about the kind of singing you do? If you're a fight species, you're in an aggregation when you're trying to breed and you want to have a complex song that stands out from your competitors. If you're a flight species, you're not near all the females. They got to find you. So you're going to make these loud, simple, repeated songs to attract distant, dispersed females to you so you can mate. What about the timing of singing? Well, if you're a fight species, you're going to peak in winter in these aggregations. If you're a flight species, you're going to peak just about a month after carving because gestation in blue whales is about 11 months. So when they carve, well, mating is going to be about a month later than that. So you can carve back in the period just after you finish feeding in summer. Um, do they sing more in fall? I would say this is a somewhat open question. Um, I've been working on a, on a project with a very large number of collaborators who've, uh, who, are, who have done amazing hydrophone work in the Southern Hemisphere and Indian Ocean. So for example, here are the hydrophone data for Antarctic blue whale songs in the Indian and uh, Indian Ocean mostly. And what you see is pretty much every month of the year, there are Antarctic blue whale calls pretty much everywhere, except the very uh, most equatorial regions, which they only get to in, in midwinter. So singing is widely dispersed. It appears to be all year round. Seems to be a perfect way of getting information on where Antarctic blue whales occur. But when you delve into it, and bottom right here is the Antarctic plot, um, across all these areas, they sing more in June and July than in other months. And when you repeat that analysis for the other five populations in this area, they all peak in singing in any time from April to July, mostly between March and July. In other words, exactly when you'd expect mating to occur is when their singing is at its peak. They still sing all in the other months too, just nowhere as, as much. Now this could be, this is a model fitted to data, and it could be the data we have are not comprehensive enough, it doesn't cover enough of the northernmost areas where these populations might go in the winter and, and spring months. So it might be a question of bad coverage. Um, so I'm going to give just a little bit of evidence from New Zealand that, that I, I believe this to be true, that they call more in fall. And this is just a fabulous paper that I worked on with Dawn, Dawn uh, Barlow. Um, and she looked at the intensity of singing in New Zealand, where, where blue whales are present all year round. We, we know that from sighting and stranding data. And what you find is their singing does indeed peak in May in exactly this time when you'd expect mating to be at uh, its highest level. Um, and this exactly coincides with this plot of the fetal data from Antarctic blue whales in, in gray in the background, pygmy blue whales in blue in the foreground, and the fetal data from New Zealand in the red triangles, all suggesting that when they give birth at about six to seven meters, it would be in about a month before the peak in singing. But still, I would say this is not established. But if it is true, there are some massive implications for um, our work on using hydrophone data to figure out where blue whales are. Because we often assume that blue whales sing e equally all year round. And so 
where you detect them and when you detect them suggests where they are and gives you a really good idea of their distribution year round. But if they sing more in fall, we need to account for this when inferring their presence and their movements from hydrophone data. Is this a testable hypothesis? Absolutely. Uh, we can test it in two ways. We can look at the timing of singing peaks with known timing of presence from other data, such as sightings and surveys. So for example, we know that North Hem Northern Hemisphere bluebells typically sighted most in June to November when they're feeding, yet the singing in, that population, in those populations peaks in October to November, just before they depart the feeding grounds uh, and just before they'd be ramping up to, towards the mating season. We can also look at non-song calls. So blue whales also make these, these decalls that are present in all populations. And it's thought that those are, um, are done when they're feeding or they're in social contact with other blue whales. So looking back at New Zealand, the blue here is the song calls that, that are only made by males. The green are the decals, the feeding and social contact calls that are made both by males and females. And what is striking here is, yes, there is a peak in the green during May when there's a peak in the, in the singing, but there is another even bigger peak in October, November, December in the same region on the same hydrophones, suggesting that blue whales are indeed present in this area year round but they sing much more in the fall than other times of the year. So it seems odd to say they sing these super loud, super strong calls, and yet they're afraid of killer whales. Um, well, well, if blue whale calls can be heard from hundreds of, or even thousands of kilometers away with a, with a Navy sonar array, uh, hydrophone array, uh, why don't the killer whales just go and eat them? And the answer is, their calls are so low frequency that killer whales cannot hear them call. The killer whale audible frequency is, at its lowest end, is about 500 hertz. Uh, they really can't hear much below about 2,000 hertz. And blue whale calls are well below that. They're acoustically invisible to killer whales. And something I just realized in the last couple of months is that the fight species and the flight species sing at different frequencies. The upper range of humpbacks is 24,000 hertz, well within killer whale range. But maybe they don't care as much because they're in these aggregations and they're going to defend themselves. Whereas flight species, they don't want to be found by blue whales, by, by killer whales. And so they sing super low. So blue whales, fin whales, say whales all sing at frequencies well below what killer whales can hear. Now, I don't know if this holds up. I basically, these numbers come from an internet, re internet search. Perhaps all of them have calls that could be heard at higher frequencies, but I think it's generally true that killer whales can't hear, um, can't hear these baleen whales. Unless you think this is the only case of acoustically invisible cetaceans, there's a very well-known paper showing that there are a select few species of toothed whales, odontocetes, that restrict their sound production to either very low, below 2000 hertz, or very, very high, greater than 100,000 hertz sounds, which are above the hearing range of killer whales. So I don't think it's implausible that there's acoustic crypsis in baleen whales as well amongst the flight species. So why do they do this? Fear, again, so food and fear. Okay, I'm gonna go through one more mystery and this is the mystery of the missing blue whale calves. We know from whaling data that blue whales give birth about every two or three years. The pregnancy rates are around 40%, in all the catch data. And so if you were to go out and look for blue whales, you would expect to see about 15% of all of the blue whales accompanied by calves. Not the males, obviously, just the females and not the young, young whales, because they've got to be old enough to have calves. Um, but of all the non-calf population, about 15% should have 
calves with them. So where are all these calves? What happened to them all? I was chatting to Richard Sears, which really sparked my th th this topic. And he said he's been studying blue whales in the Gulf of St. Lawrence for 45 years. And in that time, he had encountered 35 individual blue whale calves. There have been years when North Atlantic right whales have seen more calves sighted in one year than he has seen in 45 years in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And also, he says, only one of those calves has ever been recited anywhere again. And this got me thinking, like, how can that be? I mean, this population would have gone extinct if they were only producing like one calf a year that wasn't surviving. So where are all the calves? And I, I, I contacted a bunch of colleagues and said, how many calves do you see in your study areas? And all of them came back with numbers like 1%, 2%, 4%. The highest was 10%. Nobody was getting 15%. So is this a low birth rate? Is this high calf mortality? Are they hiding them? What, what's going on with the calves? And the first clue is that most people work on blue wells when they're aggregated. In feeding aggregations in summer. Okay, there are very, very few long-term studies that concentrate their efforts on winter regions of blue wells because they are mostly dispersed. We don't know where they go in winter. Okay, so that's the first clue. So, but also there's a timing issue. So my idea is this, is that blue wells leave the feeding grounds and immediately calve. By the time they're ready for weaning, which happens about seven months later, they're about to return to their summer feeding grounds and the blue whale calves are, are, are basically weaned. And so on all these feeding grounds where people study blue whales, you don't see the blue whale calves because they calve just after they leave the study area and they wean them just before they come back. Um, there might also be the case that mothers with calves actively avoid areas where there are winter concentrations to avoid the risk of killer whale predation. Um, but also any calf you see on the summer feeding grounds are pretty in that tail end. They were born late and maybe they have lower survival. So could this be tested? Well, yes. If calves are being killed by killer whales, their survival is going to be much lower than adults. And that's absolutely true. Um, if you study winter feeding areas, maybe the Gulf of California versus summer feeding areas like California itself, you should see more cars in the winter areas than the summer areas. And finally, we have satellite data. Can we not look at the biopsies for satellite tagged blue wells and say, oh, these ones were pregnant. We can tell from the um, progesterone concentrations. Where did they go after they were tagged? Did they go somewhere far away from, from typical migration paths? So that's the mystery of the missing calves. So now I'm going to pull you back and say, okay, I said humpback whales feed in summer and winter they migrate to shallow, calm coastal regions. And once they arrive there, they form large aggregations and they carve and they mate and they fast in the winter. Um, blue whales feed in summer and in fall, they carve immediately while dispersed in the open ocean. And in fall and winter, they sing loudly and they eat and they mate wherever they feel like it. They're basically hobbits. Okay. So thanks very much for listening in. Thanks for the audience. I have, I almost hesitate to put up an acknowledgement slide because I know that I'm missing a whole bunch of people that I've worked with, that I got ideas from, that I've asked for data from. But as a very small subset of those, I'm super grateful to thank you all very much. I have received some funding over the years from the International Whaling Commission, um, not for any particular parts of this research. Um, but I welcome any questions people have. And thanks for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor. Um, I'm going to restart from by reading out a couple of questions that we have in the chat. And um, if other people want to um, raise their hands I sh in, and ask the question themselves, I should be able to see it on my screen. Um, the first one, uh, 
The first question is, apologies if you mention it, but did all whale species evolve at the same time as killer whales? Does evolution have any part to play in the differences between fight and flight species? Surely it would be better for the fight group not to be heard by killer whales too. Um, not, not my field of interest, but I, I do recall a talk I heard many years ago um, in, in a conference organized by Jim Estes where, where I believe they said that all of the Odontocetes and the Mysticetes basically evolved about 35 million years ago, somewhere in that period of time. And, and killer whales only came along about 15 million years ago. And when they arrived, there was a massive decline in the number of species of large whales um, to, towards the small number of species remaining that we have now. And the idea was that maybe um, the evolution of killer whales uh, resulted in the extinction of a whole bunch of species of large whales. Um, so that's as much as I know. Um, as as far as yes, I both of them would be expected to not uh, not want killer whales around. But if you are in a tropical area surrounded by two thousand conspecifics, other humpback whales, maybe you're not as afraid of killer whales as if you're all by yourself. Okay, thanks. Um, there's a, a very specific question. Uh, related to the different scales in the slide with the decals versus the songs, uh, whether you can comment on the different scales, maybe you could, yeah, thank, oh, I think there we go. Oh yeah. So, so, um, the measure of decals was individual number of detected calls, but the measure for the, the, the song calls, because they start to overlap and then you can't identify individual calls. Um, it was purely amount of energy produced by all the calls combined. Um, so it's kind of a, a bit of a smoothed um, measure, whereas decals are individual calls, but they, they, they measure effectively the same thing. Okay. Uh, we have a question which I'll repeat in the room where I am. So Anna, if you want to speak up. Um, You'll have to be a bit closer to the. No, I'll 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 repeat it. Sorry, the the efficiency of. So the the question is whether there's been any studies on the effectiveness of the proposed anti predator survival, particularly on on calves. So is there is there actual data that that looks at the effectiveness? I guess primarily of the fight versus flight strategies. Um, I, it, it, there are very, very few observed predation events. Um, and they typically happen offshore quite far away from people. Um, and so I don't think, I think it would be quite hard to infer anything. A, a lot of what has been done is looked at, at what proportion of whales have rake marks from killer whale tooth, teeth on them. Um, and that's pretty high for all whale species, but it all, they all seem to occur when they're very young individuals and don't often get more rake marks as they get older. Um, so it does, but the problem is like the, like the classic, the airplanes that come back off being shot at are the ones that, you know, don't have bullet, bullet marks in the fuel tanks because all of those disappeared. So you only see the ones that survived. You can't make any inference about how many were killed by killer whales. So it is a little tricky to make inference about that. Okay, um, we're. I'm going to ask uh, one more quick question because we're almost out of, out of time. Um, and uh, sorry, Lee, I'm going to have to uh, ask an earlier question about. You said Trevor at the beginning. You said something about blue whales that don't feed only on krill. Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, in, in off Sri Lanka, there've been um, a, a DNA tests on their their poop, which is bright red, which is really cool, but. Um, and they seem to feed partly on krill and partly on mysids, which are, which are also shrimp that not being a krill biologist, I'm like, that looks like a krill to me. The same same size, they swarm, very similar behavior, um, but in the, in the mysid family. And off Baja, California, I wouldn't say it's slam dunk, but anecdotal evidence, they might feed on, on uh, pelagic red crabs, 
um, which are also swarm. Um, they're a swarming species that are, they're not really crabs, they're a different group, but they also swarm and they're about the right size to be eaten. 